Hey there, I'm Newsy's James Packard. Welcome to Tell Me More. This show is all about conversation. Newsy and its partners are bringing you in-depth conversations with some of today's most influential thought leaders. Today we're going to introduce you to a couple of philanthropists working to pave a path to equality for young children in rural areas. You know Jennifer Garner thanks to her time on screen, but you may not know that she's a huge advocate for early education and equal access. She's on the board of trustees for an organization called Save the Children. Mark Shriver is the CEO of Save the Children Action Network. Together, they sat down in front of a live audience in Chicago to discuss the organization's mission and what changes they'd like to see for families living in rural areas. Before we dive into the conversation, hosted by Aminat Tussauds, we want to give you a brief overview of Save the Children's work. The organization works globally and domestically. Here in the U.S., one major focus is education, more specifically early education. You'll hear more about some of these efforts over the next half hour. Let's dive in. But can you tell us what made you interested in rural America specifically? When once I had a voice, I felt like who is helping the kids like the kids I grew up next to in West Virginia? Who's helping kids like my mom who grew up super poor in Dust Bowl Depression, Locust Grove, Oklahoma? And if she hadn't had a leg up, if my dad hadn't had a leg up, and if they hadn't been the first in their families and the only in their families to go to college, my sisters and I would have a very different life. And I watched kids that I grew up with just not moving ahead. And I don't mean not moving ahead like going to college and having big careers. I mean that I would go to second grade and they were still in first. And I would go to third grade and they were still in first and then I never saw them again. Where are they? Where are the, the Dwayne and Dreama Boggs, the Boggs twins? I think about them so much. I'm driven by them. So, so I hunted down um, the organization that had the most efficacy in rural America. And it was Save the Children. And it was somebody who said, you've got to meet Mark Shriver. This was 10 years ago. And we've been working together ever since. Having a good time and making a big difference. Because I think you know, it's a huge issue. And I'll just give you a couple of statistics about what Jennifer just painted. Uh, when you look at the 46 poorest counties in America where child poverty rates are over 50%, 41 of those are in rural America. Um, you know, the child poverty rate in this country has dropped a little bit in the last couple of years, but it's still 18%. Oh. So one in three kids in this country, or one in three people who live in poverty are kids. And I think the issue of early childhood education, those first eight years of life, particularly in rural America, is a completely uncharted area. And it's a little exaggeration, but not much, because there is such a focus in K through 12 and trying to deal with school choice issues or teacher reform. But really, those first five years of life, when 90% of the brain growth happens in those first five years of life as a country, we don't invest there. Can you tell us about the long-term consequences about this, both for the kids and for their families? Sure. sure. I mean, you know, the, the, if you're living in poverty as a four-year-old kid in this country, you are 18 months behind socially, emotionally, and cognitively behind, you know, my kids, Jen, kids, your children, grandchildren, your little brothers and sisters. If you're in poverty in this country, I'm going to say it again, at four years of age, you're 18 months behind. And we spend billions of dollars as a country investing, trying to remediate those kids, and it's an uphill slug. It's really tough. So uncharted area, if you're interested in trying to make a profound difference, which I think is the most important social issue in this country and economic issue, we need to invest early. I mean, you've seen it, Jen. I, can you imagine going to your first day of kindergarten? Our kids are all so excited. They have their fresh little backpacks. But if you are at four years old, you're cognitively two and a half, then how do you feel your first day of kindergarten? You're already in a remedial group. You're already needing extra care. And teachers in these rural communities obviously can't handle that kind of pressure. And the schools can't handle them. So do you think you like school? Do you think you see education as a way out? No, you hate it. You start missing. It's one thing that leads to another. So when I went to Mark and said, OK, I'm ready to help kids in rural America. I want to work on our amazing in-school, after-school summer literacy programs. He said, OK, but it's too late. If you really want to focus on something, focus birth to five. 
Yeah, and Jennifer, you go on a lot of home visits with the Save the Children coordinators. What is the first thing that strikes you when you enter the homes, and what do you think is missing? What kind of interactions do the coordinators have with the kids and the parents? So the model we use is we use a home visitation program. We don't have, you know, brick and mortar places that people can bring their kids. A, we're out in the middle of nowhere. B, they often can't afford gas to get to something. They don't. There are no preschools. There are there there are elementary schools and. We work from those elementary schools and go out into the community. And we'll go to a home pretty much once a week. And when you walk into a home, when I go into a home with these people, like I was just in a home in Clay County, Kentucky earlier this week with a home coordinator, and I'll tell you what poverty sounds like. It sounds like nothing. It's silent. There's no babbling. There's no laughing. There's no joy. There's no reading, talking. Sometimes there's a drone of a TV. But pretty much, poverty is silent. People are not with friends. They're isolated. They're alone. And what happens is kids' brains shut off. There's this amazing group of people at iLabs at Washington State, and what they do is they, they are able to take a scan of a child's brain, of a baby's brain, while they're sitting in a car seat playing, and while you are interacting with the baby, they can watch the brain light up or not light up. And if you take any of our kids here and you look at their brains, the neurons, you can watch them grow in front of your eyes. You can see where it's lighting up in the brain. It's fascinating and encouraging and exciting. If you take a child who's grown up in poverty, where there's one book for every 13 kids, where, as you guys know, they hear 33 million fewer words by the time they're three, and you stick that kid in this same machine, their brain is almost black. And that's just an opportunity lost. It's not like later in life their brain is going to go, oh, now, okay, now I'm going to go ahead and grow those neurons. It's not going to happen. That's it. So in those homes, they're dropping off books. They're teaching the parents to read to the kids. They're developing the fine motor skills, you know, putting the round thing in the round hole and the square one in the square hole. Yeah. That's teaching kids how, what a square is, what a star is, the colors. And the home visitors are in there teaching the parents to do that. And as Jen said, leaving books to stimulate the brain development of those kids and getting them ready to enter kindergarten so they can learn. Because the reason that there's silence is that the parents are so stressed out. <laughs> can you imagine if you're thinking about where your next meal is coming from, if you're putting together, okay, I've got this much from WIC, this much from food stamps, and I know there's a food bank that, that gets a delivery on Tuesday, so maybe I can make it through this next week. If that's what your brain is focusing on, it's not thinking, let me get down on the floor and play with Johnny. It's just not happening. It's stressful being a mom as it is, but in my case, I had music together, I had mommy and me, I had girlfriends come over, I had great sisters, and it was modeled for me. These moms are just out there alone in the middle of nowhere. And, but the optimistic, amazing thing is when our home coordinator shows up with books and toys and energy and tons of training underneath her and behind her, she loves up on that mom and she shows the mom, it's, it's, you can do this. You already, you've got it in you to be the best mom in the world. And here's what it looks like. According to Save the Children, kids from low-income families can enter schools more than 18 months behind their more affluent peers. Jennifer Garner and Mark Shriver explain why there must be a sense of urgency to change that. <laughs> can you tell us like, how quickly you're seeing transformation? It's, uh, the, I mean, so there's an independent evaluation set up on, this, uh, on Save the Children's work here in the United States. These kids are very much at risk. They're all living in poverty. Uh, and what we've seen in the early childhood uh, results are that 90% of the kids are functioning at the n normal level uh, by the age of three. And the after school program for first, second, and third grade kids is the equivalent to eight extra months of school. So these are huge positive results that allows us to go, yeah, great. it's great. It's fantastic. And, you know, I'm uh, getting fired up here listening to you, Jennifer, but I mean, you know, you see the brain scans, right? You see from uh, Jim Heckman, who's here. Um, at the University of Chicago won a Nobel Prize in economics saying that high quality early education results in a 13% per child per year savings. So the economics is there, the science is there, the results from programs like Save the Children's are there. What is unchartered is this crowd needs to get fired up and get yeah. involved in it. Can you give us some really quickly like what the root causes of some of these problems are? Well, I think what you're seeing, as Jennifer talked about, is you know, parents are stressed. 
Uh, they don't have the resources in many cases in the homes that we were in this week in Clay County, Kentucky, which is one of the poorest counties in the country. Uh, there are no books. And those games and those toys aren't there and they have not been modeled, as Jennifer beautifully said, by her mother and sisters and friends. Um, but when you give those, res when you give those uh, resources, people are, want their kids to succeed. Yeah. And they'll do the work. And that's why the results are so strong. Uh, but what we need is a movement in this country. And I want to go back to the theme of Uncharted for just yeah. a second. You know, if you're interested in entrepreneurial, why, aren't we, why don't you invest in efforts that are focused on early ed? And I don't mean K through 12. I mean before that. The science is there. The, money, the ROI is there. The programs are there. But as a country, we don't have the energy or the political will. You know, Save the Children has 250,000 people on our mailing list that are interested in getting involved. We need that to double. We need that to triple over the next couple of years to make a difference. Yeah. I don't know. I, you <laughs> no, go we're back good. To we're good. Yeah, you know, and I mean, speaking of political will, you Scan has had some success in New Hampshire, for example, mm -hmm. on the legislative front. Can you tell us a bit more about that? So Jen and I worked uh, with Scan, which is Save the Children Action Network, which is our political arm, and we got involved in the governor's race in New Hampshire, both Republicans and Democrats. We supported one in uh, the primary. The Democrat won the primary. The Republican didn't. A uh, Republican uh, won the general election and we supported the Democrat. So we work with Republicans and Democrats all across the country. And Governor Sununu, to his credit, took up the issue that we cared most about, which is all-day kindergarten, which isn't offered in New Hampshire. And he, we worked very closely with him. But he didn't just do that because out of, I mean, he yeah. did that because you hammered so hard on, on the issue in the election. Yep. And even though he won, there was enough will politically a, around the issue that he had to, to say, yeah, of course, all day kindergarten, and it's happening. And she's 100% right. She's pretty good, right? <laughs> um, you're 100% right, and that is, he, he picked up the issue, uh, we came out and supported him on that, and it got passed, and it will affect tens of thousands of kids in New Hampshire. So we lost the battle, the election, but the issue got elevated, as Jen just said. Yeah. And Governor Sununu took it and ran with it, and there was a groundswell of support. That's because the people in New Hampshire got fired up about it. So there's change happening out there. Yeah. And it's exciting time to be involved in this uncharted area. It's getting charted a little bit, like the ocean. But if you're interested in it and you're entrepreneurial and you want to get fired up about something that's going to make a big difference in people's lives, in kids' lives, this is a great issue. Yeah, I mean, and the thing that you have both been so good about is really raising the sense of urgency around this issue. Is there a deadline for collective action? At what point, or, like, is this not reversible anymore? Well, as you know, if you're not reading at grade level by third grade, you will, your chances of graduating from high school go way down. Your chances of, of having a baby when you're a teenager go way up, of ending up in jail go way up. So yes, every day that goes by, there's a kid that we are not getting to or that someone is not getting to and catching and pulling along and pulling them out of poverty. So it's just a generation lost. And here's the other way I would say, it. if you have a four-year-old kid, like yeah. when our kid was four years old, we putting them in a preschool program are so fired up about making sure that they're in a great preschool program. And if you don't put them in the right one, they lose a quarter of their life at that point. So just think about it if you're struggling in this country. If your kid is not getting what our kids were getting when they were one or two years of age, um, that's, you know, half their life. So the sense of urgency should be right now. I mean, you know, politicians talk about our most important resources are our kids, and then they, money doesn't follow it. It's because kids don't vote. It's called the bobblehead issue. We go in and we go to Capitol Hill and we sit down and say, kids, poor kids, you got to help kids. And they say, oh, yes, poor kids, very important, very important. But then when, they, when push comes to shove, they don't, their votes don't follow. So we have to push. Welcome back to Tell Me More. Chicago Ideas is a platform that hopes to spark ideas into action. And that's exactly what Jennifer Garner and Mark Shriver are trying to do with their work. Let's get back into the conversation. I mean, I guess that's my next question to you. I think that there is a lot of will in the room here. There are a lot of really smart people. There are a lot of young people who can, you know, they have the energy and they're fired up. Like, what can we specifically do here, both on an entrepreneurship front and on a legislative front to help this issue? It's a great question. Um, Save the Children has set up this organization called Save the Children Action Network. 
It's got 250,000 people in it. You know, a lot of them don't engage on a regular basis, but a bunch of them do. And we've seen kids start programs at their school called Save the Children Action Network clubs. Um, politicians, I was in an elected office in Maryland in the state legislature for eight years. Politicians listen, uh, especially when kids show up and talk about an issue, makes a big difference. But you have to be relentlessly following up on it. Um, so they can sign up, they can uh, start a club at their high school, their college. Uh, entrepreneurs can look at different ways of helping us get our message out. We've got to raise money on both the political front as well as on the nonprofit front because we're running, as Jen just told you, we're running programs in Kentucky and California all across the country. So we need to raise money, we need to raise visibility, we need to get a small army. It's a great Margaret Mead line, right? Mm -hmm. Never doubt the power, I'm going to butcher it a little bit, but never doubt the power <laughs> of a few committed people to change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever does. So if you think, oh, I only have a couple of buddies, it's not going to make any difference. It makes a big difference, but you've got to get off your butt and get involved. Yeah. And that's what Teddy Roosevelt said, you know, it's, um, life is, the, the credit belongs to the man or woman who's in the arena. Mm. And, but you've got to get in the arena. If you sit on the sidelines and wring your hands and bitch, it's not going to change. Can you tell us also a bit more about the federal involvement specifically? Because I know that, um, you know, I think that we can do a lot as citizens, but what are states that we should be looking at or Congress people that we should really be targeting at this work in the short term and the long term? Well, Jen, we were just uh, with uh, Man uh, Emmanuel, and Chicago's doing an effort, uh, evidently, to start with a pre-K, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Jen said to the mayor, we got to go earlier. We, you know? we work as a public-private partnership, so we have to have the government's involvement, and, and we do, and we fight very hard for every single penny of it. And that's state by state, and it's also on a federal level. But then we, you know, go around, and I trudge around and we <laughs> and he trudges around and we raise the rest of the money privately. Yeah. And there's a lot going on on the federal level. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a tough time in Washington mm -hmm. right now, right? Uh, and in a lot of state capitals as well. But I tell you the one issue that Republicans and Democrats are moving on is this issue of early childhood education. Congressman Cole from Oklahoma, who is, as he has said to me, you know, and we've met with him a bunch of times, I'm a hardcore conservative from Oklahoma, is great on this issue, he's pushing it with Senator Blunt, who's a Republican from Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, so there have been investments. They're incremental investments, but they're investments, and those are important. And you see it um, you know, in a couple of states around the country. Uh, in California, there's, there's good work going on in there. In Alabama, uh, a lot of Republican governors understand that this is an, uh, an economic development issue, and that other countries, like China, are investing huge dollars in early ed. Mm -hmm. And they're going to clean our clock. They're going to clean our clock because they understand those first five years are so important. And that's why this is such a, f uh, I'm not going to do a Brad um, and drop the <laughs> but This is why this is such a big friggin' opportunity. Yeah. Um, but again, if you walk out of here today and say it was unchartered and they were nice, but you don't do anything, duh, don't do it. You know, get engaged, right? I mean, Jen has been with us. I remember our first time we talked and I'm like, you know, is this going to be a one-shot deal? We're going to go on the Today Show and talk about it and never see you again. She is relentlessly on it for 10 years because I think you can I'll tell it. you why. Because I'll just give you a little story that it just encapsulates what I can't let go of and what pushes me to work harder and harder. I was at a home in California. It was not a nice home. It was made of concrete. It was hot. There were flies. It was gross. That's not very kind. But it was not a place that you would want to be raising a family. And there was a mother there with an 11-month-old, and she had a two-week-old. She was exhausted. There was no sound in the home. The baby just sat. He was 11 months old. He wasn't crawling, walking, playing. There was a TV on. He wasn't paying attention to it. His lights were off. So we come in with the home coordinator, and she brings a ball. The little boy has never seen a ball. The mother sits across from the boy, and she's, she's tired. She doesn't really, she's kind of just um, agreeing, just going along with this. So the coordinator says to the mom, roll this ball to your little boy. So you know how much boys love to play with a ball. This little boy kind of looked at it, and the next thing you know, he touches it, and he accidentally rolls it back to his mom. And she says, he's playing with you. Roll it back to him again. And so she does, 
and he gets it and he kind of lights up and he's rolling it back, but there's no babbling, there's nothing. They roll again and then the baby makes a sound and the coordinator said, he's talking to you. And she said, my baby doesn't talk. I'll talk to him when he talks. And she said, no, this is it. This is the moment. He's talking to you. Make that sound back. And she did. And the baby was so excited to see his mom talking to him that they started a babble conversation back and forth. And then the greatest thing, the mom started smiling and laughing and the baby started smiling smiling and laughing and there was a light between them and there was this feeling that if this woman can come back week after week after week and support that mom and if this little light can shine from week after week after week and get connected that baby will be okay and that is early education that's what we're talking about that's what we do that's amazing <laughs> So on a last note to both of you, do you feel hopeful that this next generation of kids are going to have a brighter future? I feel hopeful when I sit here and I see all of you guys and we're actually talking about it. We weren't invited to talk about this stuff 10 years ago. No, definitely Nobody not. was <laughs> just like, hey, come talk about early education in poor America. I mean, this is exciting for us. This is thrilling. It's beginning of a movement. It's not the beginning of a movement. It's been around, but it's a building of momentum around something that so deserves our time and effort. And there's nothing more optimistic than catching a baby and helping them up. There's nothing more optimistic than catching a young mom when she is still feeling hopeful and energized about helping her kid get out of poverty and catching her and saying, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And it, it is, it's thrilling to see. It really is. Keeping the faith though, right, Jen? We were talking about this the other day in Kentucky. It's, you got to keep at it. And we've got to keep pushing this issue forward. Uh, I'm hopeful. Hope filled doesn't mean that you are naive about the situation. It's, it's work. Uh, but as you just said, it's the beginning. It, it is the movement's been out there. But you know, if you have a, an interest in it, and get engaged, uh, and and stay committed to it, uh, because Jennifer just told that story. I love that story. The way you just described that little kid out there. And, you know, that kid's going to enter kindergarten, and if he wants to be a car mechanic or a doctor, he's got the foundation to do that or be a lawyer or whatever that child wants to do. But if that kid cannot read, if the kid's not functioning at grade level by the end of third grade, as Jennifer said, we're going to spend billions of dollars trying to remediate that kid. And that's, you got you to be hope-filled, but you got to work hard. And you gotta, you know, we've been on the road, uh, Kentucky on Monday and Tuesday, New York, Save the Children had their big gala, came to Chicago yesterday, Jen's going back to be with her kids tonight. I mean, that's a, bold, that's a huge commitment oh. from a working mom to spend the whole week doing it. And that's what we need folks to do. So you gotta put your wallet, you gotta put your heart, um, you gotta put your energy behind it. And it's hugely rewarding, yeah. I think. I mean, what's better? Are you creating a business that's gonna help kids? I mean, what's better than that? I mean, if you make widgets or phones or my college roommate sells fish, it's good. Um, <laughs> Fortune fish in Chicago if you need them. Um, uh, but, uh, but this is like the best business in the world because you're helping people. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you both so much for being here. I hope that this has sparked some people in the audience to really put their money and their energy where their values are. And we'll keep, up follow we'll keep following up with you and we wish you the best. Thank you so much Thank for being here. Thank you. Thank for your attention. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on Tell Me More. We're working to bring you more in-depth conversations like this one. So if there's somebody you want to hear from in an extended format, just let us know. You can share your feedback and send suggestions to at Newsy on Twitter. We'll see you next time.